what I found is that there's this kind of line in the sand. It, either things become completely exceptionally fun and exciting, or you should just go home. <laughs> like there's <laughs> no benefit. And in New York, that line is 2 a.m. And so the book title is The 2 a.m. Principle, Discover the Science of Adventure. And the 2 a.m. principle is that nothing good happens after 2 a.m. except the most epic experiences of your life. Welcome to The Successful Pitch. If you're a startup founder struggling with your investor pitch, we can teach you the steps to get funded fast. We interview investors who share their pitch funding criteria. We also talk with founders who share their startup funding success stories. Funding strategist John Livesey is your host each episode. Having helped many businesses craft their funding pitch, Inc. Magazine now calls him the Pitch Whisperer. John will help you learn to craft your own concise and compelling pitch using the same tactics he used helping businesses during his 15-year award-winning sales career at Condé Nast, combined with insights from his best-selling book, The Seven Most Powerful Selling Secrets. Once you are pitch perfect from the tips you learn on this podcast, John can make the all-important warm introductions to the right investors who have appeared on the show. Your funding success begins with The Successful Pitch. Welcome to The Successful Pitch. Today's guest, John Levy, is the author of The 2 a.m. Principle, and he said at 2 a.m., you should either have an epic adventure or time to go home. He really defines what an adventure is, including having some excitement, some risk, and some growth for you personally at the end of that adventure, and it sounds very similar to what the entrepreneur's journey is. When he talks about having fun, he said, you create the fun, you don't go out and have fun. We really go through the epic model, establish, push boundaries, increase, and continue that really will help you craft the right message when you get in front of an investor. He said, the quality of our lives is defined by the people we surround ourselves with and the conversations we have with them. He's the expert at that as he hosts these secret invitation-only influential dinners that has changed his life and the number of people that he's met. Most importantly, I think he talks about Routines are the enemy of excitement, when to have a good routine and when to change it up. And finally, he writes about Ben Franklin saying that people will like us more if we ask them to do us a favor, but there's a good way and a bad way to do that. The interview begins in 45 seconds, right after this information on how you can get funded fast. Are you a funder struggling with your investor pitch? Do you need warm introductions to the right investors to get your startup funded? Do you need a funding roadmap to get you there fast? All of this and more can be found in Crack the Funding Code. Join host John Livesey and Judy Robinette, best-selling author of How to Be a Power Connector and board member of Illuminate Ventures on their free Crack the Funding Code webinar. Simply go to Judy Robinette, that's J-U-D-Y-R-O-B-I-N-E-T-T dot com and click on the webinar tab to see how to tap into their network of investors from around the world. There's a link in the show notes as well. You're only one click away from getting funded fast. Hello and welcome to the Successful Pitch Podcast. I am very excited to have John Levy on today because John is the author of the 2AM Principle. He is literally a human behavior scientist, a consultant and keynote speaker. He's the expert on influence, networking, and most importantly for me, adventure. And that's the element that people don't usually have in their lives, let alone in their business. So he's going to give us some great tips on how to have your business become an adventure and what that does for your world. Uh, He's known for having these incredible dinners that the New York Times has written about and how that transforms your life when you give people a reason to get together in a unique situation. John, welcome to the show. That's great to be on. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yes. Well, you know, one of the things that I really find so fascinating about you is starting with your Twitter handle is uh, not just your name, but the initials after it, TLB. Would you tell everybody what that stands for and why? Because I think that's a really fun place to start. Absolutely. So I was, uh, I don't know, about 17 years old. I was about to graduate from high school and I was kind of thinking, what do I want next? And I noticed that a lot of the adults around me were seeming unenthusiastic about life. Mm. Uh, Kind of like the only reason that they got out of bed was that they didn't die the night before. (laughs) And and, uh, I wanted to understand why uh, 
it is that I can hang out with my nieces and nephews and they're excited about everything all the time. Mm. And then there's a certain point where things kind of change. And so I went back and started reading a lot of uh, children's books. And one of them that I read was Peter Pan. And Peter Pan has this group of uh, rambunctious uh, kids that uh, go along with him on his adventures. And they're called the Lost Boys. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to dedicate my life to wonder and adventure. Mm. Uh, And in the hopes that that same excitement that I uh, that we see in youth is retained throughout life. And so it serves as a constant reminder that uh, in a an admiration of these characters that it's John Levy TLD or the lost boy. Isn't that great? Well, one of the things I'm constantly telling my clients when they're pitching for funding is you have to be memorable and you have to brand yourself in a way that people instantly get who you are and what you do. And you do that better than almost anybody else I've ever had the pleasure of interviewing because (laughs) it's so specific and it pulls people in. Uh, t- can you tell a little bit about how you started the idea of these incredible salon dinners? Uh, sure. So just to give the listeners a sense of what these dinners are, mm-hmm. um, 12 people are invited at a time. None of them know each other. They're not allowed to talk about what they do or even give their last name. <laughs> they cook dinner together. Uh, when they sit down to eat, they get to guess what everybody else does. And they find out that it's a famous author sitting across from a Nobel laureate, the president of a television network sitting across from the editor in chief of one of the top magazines in the world or a two time Olympic gold medalist sitting across from a famous actor or actress. And so I've hosted about 900 people uh, across close to 100 dinners and uh, everything you could imagine from uh, members of royalty through Grammy Award or uh, Tony or essentially any kind of award-winning artists or even uh, Fields Medal winners or mathematicians. So uh, it's developed into this community that's pretty uh, wild and incredibly humbling to spend time around. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so interesting because, you know, investors say all the time, if you can't figure out how to get a warm introduction to me, you probably can't figure out how to get to your customers. And you have some amazing ideas, not only of what you've done and how it's changed your life, but also you have some suggestions, I think, from listening to some of your other interviews on how people can not have to spend a lot of money and make it their own, right? Oh, without a doubt. So uh, one of the things I suggest is uh, that you... If you want to connect with people, the first thing is it's not about networking. Mm -hmm. So networking brings up ideas of people at conferences, handing out business cards (laughs) and uh, trying to find clients. It's a very one way um, interaction where I'm trying to collect as many names or people uh, for a specific objective. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. It's just not a very powerful context to be in. Mm. And the reason is that if you look at research by Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, they wrote a book called Connected. uh, And it's all about the surprising impact of our social networks. Hmm. And what they started off studying was the obesity epidemic. They were curious if it passes from person to person uh, the way a cold does or if it's a percentage of the population kind of like Alzheimer's, right? You you don't get Alzheimer's because you're hanging out with somebody who, who has it. It's not contagious. And what they found was obesity actually transfers from person to person. If you have a if you have a friend who's obese, your chances increase by 45 percent. Your friends who don't know them, 25 percent increase their friends by 10 percent and their friends by 5 percent, which means that if you. If I meet somebody extraordinary, right, and what they actually also found was that everything passes through our networks like that from happiness Mm. to voting habits to smoking habits, exercise, all that. And so this also means that if I meet somebody extraordinary, it's not only important that I get to know them and spend time with them, but that they end up uh, spending time with my friends because that will lead them to having a positive impact on my friends Mm. who will in turn have a positive impact on me. Mm. So it's less about networking uh, and more about community building. I love that. We're going to tweet that out. It's not about networking. It's about community building. And what you're describing, John, sounds like the ripple effect in the whole wave, the physics behind it, right? 
It's absolutely that. That if you can uh, if you can find uh, the right people and bring them together, then by having a positive impact on each other and being able to change the cultural conversation taking place, mm -hmm. uh, you can achieve essentially whatever it is that you want for your life, your business, your community. And so the mission of the influencers became to impact the quality of our members' lives, their communities, and hopefully one day the world. Mm. With the understanding that by bringing extraordinary people together, we would be able to have further and further reaching goals. Uh, not only that, but the the age or the time when a single human being uh, could have a dramatic impact on the world has kind of changed. Now you need such a diversity of knowledge and experience to create major impact. And so what you need to look at are uh, groups of people from varied backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a huge supporter that let's say you are – a, uh, you have a startup, right? It's a tech startup. You're used to hanging out with tech people. Adding another tech person might be nice, but it won't necessarily increase your knowledge. Mm -hmm. You all are reading the same books. You're all <laughs> hanging out in the same social circles. It's, it's a bit of a stagnant experience. But adding somebody in finance, adding somebody in uh, medicine, all of these people then bring new ideas that can trigger inspiration and also expand your second degree network significantly hmm. because a study was done that looked at how people actually get their jobs and what they found is that most people get their jobs based on loose ties. So the people you kind of know hmm. Be because they're far more of those than the people that we know closely. So if we diversify our communities, then it increases in general the number of people that we kind of know or have ties to. Right. It's so valuable. Well, let's speaking of reading the same kind of books and not reading the same kind of books, mm -hmm. the 2 a.m. principle is a very different kind of book for people to read. And I love the title. So let's start with that. Where, what does it mean, the 2 a.m. principle? Well, let me start off with um, I spent a lot of my life searching for adventure. Mm hmm. I, last year, I went to all seven continents. Every year, I do a big travel project. Like I once did one where every month I traveled to the biggest event in the world, wherever it was. Hmm. Um, and what I found is that there's this kind of line in the sand where either things become completely exceptionally fun and exciting, or you should just go home. <laughs> like there's no benefit. And in New York, that line is 2 a.m. Mm hmm. And so the book title is nothing uh, is the 2 a.m. principle, discover the science of adventure. And the 2 a.m. principle is that nothing good happens after 2 a.m. except the most epic experiences of your life. Mm. So if you're going to stay up past that point, you better make it incredible. I and know. also know that in different cities, it's a different time. So Chicago, mm. it might be 1 p.m. And <laughs> certain Latin American countries, it might be 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning because you don't even go out until 2. Mm-hmm. Got it. Well, in your book, The 2 a.m. Principle, you have a great definition of adventure. Mm -hmm. Would you break those three uh, concepts up for us? Oh, gladly. And one of the things I really was happy with uh, when I was looking to define adventure mm -hmm. was as an entrepreneur to find the incredible overlap that it has with uh, the entrepreneurial experience. Oh, great. And so as I see it, an adventure is an experience that is one, exciting and remarkable. Now, this is important because as a society or as a species, we've passed down our knowledge through an oral history. Mm -hmm. So if it's not worth remarking about, actually speaking about, it's not culturally significant. Mm. And as an entrepreneur, if what I'm doing isn't remarkable, if it's not worth talking about, it's not relevant as a company. Love it. And so if you're pitching, if you're selling, whatever it is, you have to really be able to express that element of what you're producing that is remarkable, hmm. that people will then talk about. Yes. Two, possesses adversity and or risk, preferably perceived risk. So what does that actually mean? Well, in an adventure, you have to overcome an obstacle. But people often confuse these dangers, like climbing Everest, mm -hmm. with perceived risks, like uh, going parachuting. Now. The important thing is that 
in, as an entrepreneur, we always uh, there's always this impression that we take on immense amounts of risk. But if you look at the most successful entrepreneurs, they mostly take risks that are highly mitigated, mm-hmm. highly calculated. So um, did you ever read Originals by Adam Grant? Yes. Mm. Excellent book. And Grant is a brilliant researcher and writer. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I love is he shares the story of the founders of Warby Parker. <laughs> and these people um, are uh, brilliant because what they did was they kept their, I think, jobs and internships long past the point that Warby Parker was profitable mm-hmm. and showing signs of success. And the reason was that there's no need to take on the additional risk. Mm. That you can have a startup without throwing everything else aside um, that does great and that makes money and grows at a healthy pace. And once it's fully established at a point where you can support yourself and you're not spending your time worrying about, oh, how are you going to pay for lunch or (laughs) you're stuck eating ramen noodles, Mm -hmm. then you go full time into it. It's almost like the Maslow principle, right? Get the basics handled of food and shelter, and then you can start doing self-actualization. And, you know, the originals really talks about, you know, you can be yourself, right? Don't think that if you're not an early bird, you're not going to be successful. That's, I think, a big sink with what you're all about, too. It's like, be who you are. And no matter what time of day that is, then you can work, right? Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. You have to be, um, and people often... uh, ask me for advice on networking and so on. And one of the things that I often emphasize is that there's a, uh, this perception that the right way to be in American culture is this extrovert that is a larger than life personality and so on. And there's no real evidence that suggests that that makes you more successful. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, you just have to be respectful of if you're an introvert, that those are the, that's the way you are. And you have to just take on different practices. Right. So we be remarkable, mm-hmm. mitigate your risk, and then the third part of an adventure. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's exciting and remarkable. Um, it is possesses adversity and or risk, mm-hmm. and the third is it brings about growth. The person you are at the end is distinct from the person who started. Mm-hmm. Meaning that if you look at any great journey, uh, it's not necessarily reaching the objective that's important. It's the growth that the characters take on or experience as a byproduct. They get to be expanded versions of themselves. That really explains in a new way for me that whole phrase that I heard as a kid and never really understood, which is it's about the journey, not the destination. And when I was a kid, it was like, what are you talking about? These car rides are boring. I want to get to where we're going. Uh And, And now the way you framed it, I totally understand that it's about the growth you experience during that journey, not just arriving at whatever location you're getting to. Yes. So, you know, I go out on these wild adventures. I'll like drop myself off in a foreign city and I won't have a place to sleep. I don't know anybody. (laughs) I don't speak the language. And either I convince somebody to put me up for the night Hmm. or I sleep on the street. Wow. And so I have a clear mission and an objective. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily about the success of it. If I have to pull an all nighter and just walk the streets, I'll survive. I'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But the type of person that I have to be in order to get a stranger to take me in is an expanded version of myself. Aha. This is what fascinates me about you, John, and how it relates to getting investors to trust a startup to invest with them is they have to trust them first. And if Mm -hmm. you're giving an extreme example of someone having to trust you that they just met you to invite you to spend the night at their on their sofa or what have you, it Mm -hmm. really is a, a microcosm of what's going on when someone's getting an investor to trust them to give them all this money, right? It's how do you, what's an expanded, Without a doubt. yeah, what's an expanded version of yourself? How could someone take what you do, or I'm going to have you tell what you do to expand yourself and then go, huh? So the next time I'm in front of an investor or even just n- connecting with people at an event, how can I be an expanded version of myself to break down the initial trust issues? So it's, um, One of the things that I do as a practice is that if something scares me and it's not going to kill me, Mm. it's probably a good idea to do it. (laughs) Well, that's like that uh, opening to your book, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Tell tell that story really quick because that's so riveting. Oh, my God. I Okay. So 
It's about nine o'clock in the morning, July 7th, 2014. I'm uh, in Pamplona, Spain, and I've just made it through the running portion of Running of the Bulls. Mm. I end up at the stadium and inside uh, once, well, there's this really weird thing called the winter effect, which is if you have a success, your body fills with testosterone hmm. uh, to kind of prep you for the next battle so oh. that you're, you have a higher chance of winning. The problem is that if you keep winning and keep winning and keep winning, uh, you flood with so much testosterone that you don't make really good decisions. And in nature, animals spend too much time in the open. Mm, Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, that's exactly it. Or uh, and they'll get killed or they'll get into unnecessary fights and and uh, die. Mm. So in my case, what I thought would be a really good idea would be to like run up to a bull and smack it. Mm. And so I do that a couple of times. And then I realize, oh, dear, it would be super cool is if I let a bull jump over me oh, at the boy. entrance. So that's how they get in and out. Uh -huh. they, uh, and um, so I take the safest position I could and the bull comes in full speed uh, and uh, it slips hmm. and tries to make the jump but I realize I'm totally in a bad situation and it misses its jump and lands on my back and crushes me oh. and I lose all feeling in my torso and I'm I'm have this every, like literally everything goes silent time stops and I'm pretty sure like in that moment that I might be paralyzed because I, I can't feel anything. I can't move. Uh. And so I have this internal conversation where I'm like, okay, John, you've decided to live a life as this adventure mm. and it may have totally screwed you. Uh, you have to be okay with the fact that you did this mm -hmm. and that it was just a fluke and you may not get out of this. Mm. Uh, and you may be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I was like, okay, I can handle that. And then time started again, and I somehow managed to stand up and search for medical assistance, but nobody was could help me because they were literally dragging bodies out of the way from people who were hit, you know, ten times worse than me. And uh, eventually, what we found out was that I, I went to triage, and that it had crushed my left shoulder, mm -hmm. and. Uh, luckily, miraculously, nothing was broken, but the pain was so intense. I started going unconscious and, uh, I ended up needing wheelchair service at the airports and all that in six months of physical therapy. Whew. Yeah. And was, a great opening to your book. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well worth it. Oh man. All right. Thank you for that. I just had to let everybody hear that story personally, because reading it is a page turner. Uh, so now back to how do you, so we can learn from you, create an expanded version of yourself to create trust in a stranger to let you spend the night on their sofa? Uh, so there's a few things. One is I, uh, well, there's, there's two ways to kind of look at it. Mm -hmm. One is uh, understanding the science behind it. Mm. And the second is understanding the practices that fulfill on that. Okay. So uh, from the practices standpoint, uh, I speak to everybody. Mm. I speak to everybody and embarrass myself pretty consistently. <laughs> uh, and the reason is that I'm willing to be uncomfortable. Mm. You see, I, I believe that the scope or the size of your life is in direct proportion to how uncomfortable you're willing to be. Ooh, that's fascinating. The bigger your willingness to be uncomfortable is, the bigger your life will be. Would that be accurate? Yes. Okay. So, uh, your tolerance for discomfort will define the size of your life. Mm. So, um, I am willing to be incredibly uncomfortable, uh, and it's something that I embrace. And I know not everybody's like that, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm very clear that most of the concerns that I have are completely perceptual. Mm. I might end up feeling like a jackass after, mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, but those feelings will fade. Yeah. Um, but what I'll learn in the process about engaging people is invaluable. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the practice. Now, the science behind it is interesting. So there are certain things that clearly uh, make people trust you more in general, assuming you don't have a creepy smile. <laughs> um, but there's also some interesting uh, characteristics like the Ben Franklin effect. The Ben Franklin effect is... Uh, we all know that if I do you a favor, 
you'll like me more. It's mm-hmm. reciprocity, right? Right. Um, and these are general rules. They don't apply to every single person, but in general. And then the Ben Franklin effect, Franklin had this contentious um, rival mm-hmm. uh, politically. And uh, rather than try to win him over, he decided that what he would do is uh, ask a favor. And that way, Franklin, uh, sorry, the rival will have to invest effort into their relationship. Mm -hmm. So he asked to borrow this rare book. The man does it. And what happened was his demeanor totally changed after that point because now he's invested into the relationship Mm. rather than fighting something. (laughs) So I'm a strong believer in asking people for favors uh, because, one, it will get them to invest into the relationship. And two, then it'll make you more likely to invest into the into that. So it serves to build community. Uh-huh. Which there is something go. that I'm, I'm always committed to. Um, now, when you're asking for favors, there's a, a re- additional research that suggests that you should stack them from small to large. Right. Meaning, if I can get you to invest a little bit of effort, you'll then invest even more effort because I am seen as somebody worthy of your effort. <laughs> so, if I wanted to ask a stranger for complex directions, I would first ask them for the time. And then for the complex directions, Mm -hmm. because once they've invested, they would be more willing to invest more. Love it. That's so valuable to just because it's almost counterintuitive to think, well, why would I, I, how can I ask somebody I don't know a favor, but you've really explained it well. Well, before I let you go, I want to dive into this last topic, which is so fascinating for everybody, which is routine is the enemy of excitement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm a huge fan of routines for productivity, mm-hmm. right? I get up, I do my first most important thing every morning, I knock it out and I, and then like I have routines for everything from fitness to, um, you know, communication habits. Uh, but routine fundamentally is not an exciting experience mm-hmm. because the more we're exposed to something, the less novel it'll be. Mm-hmm. and. So if you want to lead an exciting life, you have to be willing to go outside of your routine. You have to go explore things that are novel and different from what you've already experienced. Mm, That's great. Well, the other thing that's a big takeaway from your book, and I highly recommend everybody get a copy instantly, is you don't have fun, you create fun, and the moment you stop creating it, it will disappear. And Mm -hmm. I think that totally shifts everyone's perspective, right? Like if you go to, I don't know, Disneyland, if you're at Disneyland, and you're like, I've had fun here before, or I hear it's a fun place, they Mm -hmm. brand it as the most magical place on earth, I better have a lot of fun. Guess what? You could be miserable at Disneyland if you don't, you have to bring the fun, right? Yeah. (laughs) It's a mental state, it's an attitude, and it's something that requires practice. Mm. People often are surprised by the amount of effort I put into ensuring my own happiness, Mm. but it is a lot of work. (laughs) Our natural state isn't happiness, Uh you know, and we have to work at that the way we work on our relationships, the way that we uh, have a fitness uh, routine for our health and wellness. Yep. Everything is a practice that's deserving of its time and attention. And the benefits are so worth it. Like you said, you know, if you want to have a small life, stay in your comfort zone. If you want to have a big life, constantly push yourself. I can't thank you enough, John. The book is The 2 a.m. Principle on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Your Twitter is at John Levy T L B for the Lost Boys. And how else can people follow you and keep track of what your adventures? Um, on Snapchat, uh, Instagram, mm-hmm. I, you'll see completely insane photos <laughs> sometimes of my... Uh, great friends that I met through the dinners, traveling around the world. Nice. And uh, you can also find me on my website, johnlevytlv.com, J-O-N-L-E-V-Y, T like Thomas, L like Lion, B like Boy. Love it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Successful Pitch Podcast. If you like the show, please go to iTunes and write a review and encourage your friends to write reviews too. It really helps get the word out. You know, people say that the longest distance is between someone's mouth and their wallet. People can tell you they're going to invest, but when it comes time to write the check, they don't do it. So how do you get people to say yes and then follow through? Visualize yourself on the left side of a riverbank and you have to cross the river and on the other side of the river is where the funding happens. 
So first, you make up your idea, and then you make it real, and then you make it reoccur. Once you start dipping your toe into the water to get the funding, that's where I can help. I get you across that river faster than you would on your own, with a lot less frustration than you will get when you hear a bunch of no's and you don't know why. So if you want some help getting funded faster with less frustration, go to my free funding webinar, Selling Secrets for Funding.com forward slash webinar and sign up and get in-depth information on how you can get funded fast. Thanks.